Okay, uh, welcome everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. When you're ready, Paratosh, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you, Tara. Uh, can I? Uh, can you already see my screen, or I should uh, reshare it? You, you'll need to reshare it. Okay. Yes. Can you see my slide, or you're yes. seeing the? Yes, we, we okay. can see your slide and, and full screen. Looks great. Perfect. So yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much again for uh, inviting me to this wonderful uh, webinar series. I have seen uh, previous uh, webinars hosted by Sano uh, series. And I, I must say there are uh, so many experts talking about on various aspects of plastic pollution. So it's, it's a great learning opportunity for uh, me as well. About me, I'm uh, my name is Paritoy Deshpande. And I'm an associate professor at NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, uh, located in Trondheim, Norway. Uh, and I deal with plastic pollution since past five to six years. Uh, uh, plastic pollution or plastic pollution from fishing sector was a part of my PhD topic as well, where we investigated uh, what would be the management strategies and how much is the extent of pollution happening from fishing sector. Uh, and what is the Norway's, uh, what, what is the status and how to move ahead when it comes to uh, sustainable management of waste from plastic uh, within the region. So today I'm going to share uh, some of my research uh, along with some of the latest findings on the topics of plastic pollution from fishing sector. Uh, we'll talk about impacts and then some of the management strategies. Yes, so I have divided the presentation in three parts today. Uh, first, we'll see the state of plastic pollution with, a, with some background of uh, the fishing sector. What exactly is the contribution of fishing sector? Why is it important when it comes to plastic pollution discussion uh, in a broader sense? I'll provide you with some background of uh, how the fishing gears look like and why do we need to look at uh, them from the angles for management and so on. We'll also talk about the impacts from fishing gears on ecosystem, both aquatic and terrestrial. And then I'll move on to the case of Norway, where I'll present my research on how I, how we at uh, NTNU mapped the various plastic flow from fishing sector of Norway, and then uh, use this particular knowledge to further develop management strategies uh, for the similar type of waste. Before concluding, I'll also try to uh, summarize the findings and also try to show you uh, the broader discussions of circular economy and how fishing sector or plastics from fishing sector can be utilized uh, through the lenses of circular economy and so on. Uh, so before starting, uh, you all know this particular paper. I'm, I'm sure uh, this paper from Jena Jembeck and uh, colleagues came out in Science 2015, which uh, talked about uh, the study summarized the state of handling and management of plastic waste across the globe. The study concluded that alarming eight to 12 million metric tons of uh, waste plastics go into the ocean through land-based sources, sheerly due to mismanagement. This vital piece of evidence raised uh, several concerns uh, and the world started taking plastic waste more seriously after this particular uh, study or the findings. However, there is one gap that the study uh, had and that was identified by Jim Beck saying, this total plastic waste from land to ocean excludes or does not include plastic from fishing in the ocean as well as plastics from fishing sector that is disposed on land. But, okay, so why is plastics from fishing sector is more important or why, sh why should this study, uh, uh, why this knowledge gap should be addressed? Well, we'll get, before knowing that, we need to know what exactly are the impacts uh, from fishing sector and how plastic is related to fishing sector and so on. So here I'll begin the first part of uh, this whole talk where we'll discuss the brief background of fishing sector and then I'll come back to what impacts fishing sector has uh, on terrestrial and aquatic ocean ecosystem. So the brief history of fishing, if you look at it, uh, I know most of us are not 
coming from fishing background. So I tried to include some of the basic historical developments in fishing sector. So fishing practices are not new to human uh, mankind. It goes back to 1800 century where we used to use wooden or harpoon or sticks to catch fishes from the shallow water. The, then the technology has developed uh, over the years. Uh, the technology has developed over the years and then uh, we started using more of the natural fibers such as uh, jute, cotton and hemp. Uh, to catch the again shallow water fishes, uh, fishes, fishes on the coastal and midwater uh, region. After 1940 onwards, however, there are several technological developments and advancement took place. The, the rap rapid industrialization, the uh, and then the uh, we were introduced with the new synthetic fiber called as plastic polymers, and the introduction of these very strong. Uh, fibers uh, ensured that the fishing gears are becoming more stronger, flexible, and as well as long lasting. So because of uh, the use of plastic fibers such as polyethylene, polypropylene, and nylon, fishing gears not only became durable, they also became flexible and long lasting. But then with this, there was a problem as well. Before going on to the problems, I'll try to define uh, what exactly fishing gear means. Because the common understanding of fishing gears for someone who is not from the background, we understand that fishing gear is just a fishing net, you know? But that's not uh, what commonly people identify when we talk about fishing gears. Fishing gear is nothing but any physical device or combination of items that may be placed on or in the water or on the seabed with the intended purpose of capturing, harvesting marine or freshwater organism, whether or not it is in association with a vessel, that means fishing vessel or not. So in a broader sense, fishing gear consists of various items such as fishing net, then ropes, and then there are several metal wires depending on the size of fishing gear. Uh, then there, there are also floats and boils which are associated with the fishing gear so that fishing gear can uh, still remain, uh, can be identified from the surface. And then there are associated chains and wires through which fishing gears are operated from the bigger vessels. The sizes and purposes of fishing gears vary a lot. The smallest fishing gear can weigh up to five to seven kgs, where the biggest fishing gear can weigh up to 40,000 to 50,000 kilograms. Uh, so the size and mass proportions vary significantly when it comes to various fishing gears. The bigger fishing gears such as purse signs, trawls, and Danish signs weigh, uh, these are also called as advanced fishing gears. And these are usually used by uh, the deep water fishing vessels. And they weigh up any, anywhere between 10 to 50,000 uh, 50, kilograms of material. Whereas smaller fishing gears such as long lines, gill nets, hand lines, crab pots, and so on. They are used by uh, the coastal fishing vessels more often than not. So, so far we have learned about the vast variety between fishing gears, but then there are also some of, some of the term, uh, some, of, some terms we need to define right at the outset or right at this point before moving ahead. The first one is derelict fishing gear. Drillic fishing gear or also abandoned, lost or discarded fishing gears, ALDFG, is often an outcome when a fishing gear is abandoned, lost or otherwise discarded by the fish, uh, fishers upon operations or during the operation. And these, these lost fishing gears, they, they contribute to the phenomenon called as ghost fishing. Ghost fishing is defined as the ability of fishing gear or lost fishing gear to continue fishing for a long period of time after all control of that gear is lost by a fisherman. So there are several reasons for fishing gear to get lost in the ocean. Some of them are, uh, so to say, extreme weather conditions such as storms and uh, eye shuffling of ropes and so on, bottom snags, navigational collisions, uh, and that means entanglement with other fishing gears and so on, faulty fishing methods, abandonment, purposeful abandonment or vandalism of fishing gear, human error, 
damaged by marine organisms and gear failures are identified as some of the most occur uh, most uh, frequently occurring reasons uh, due to which fishing gears get lost and become derelict uh, in the ocean surface well okay the fishing gears get lost in the ocean it is a part of any uh, operation any physical operations you uh, the pollution or physical impacts uh, of course they do happen but what are the impacts of losing the fishing gear in the ocean that is where it becomes more threatening fishing gears as compared to other plastic waste have multitudes of impacts when it gets lost in the ocean first and foremost is uh, they affect the marine wildlife in a negative way you have to see that fishing gears they are designed for capture or kill uh, to capture or kill the marine organisms and even if you lose the control the the purpose still remains there so uh, these particular lost fishing gears they keep on catching or affecting the marine wildlife such as shark or turtles or any of the marine or, uh, organism which comes in contact with the fishing gear for example so it's a direct impact on marine wildlife second is the fact that discarded fishing nets comes with a cost it also has a economic impact because these fishing gears they float around randomly in the ocean boats uh, the fishing vessels don't see them until they are too late the nets can get stuck in the boat's propellers which forces someone from the boat for example fishers or someone from the boat to jump and untangle these nets to, uh, from the propeller this is both risky and time consuming additionally these nets can also catch a lot of commercially valuable fish that ultimately die in the ghost nets that is the definition of ghost nets for example in this picture uh, in the middle picture you can see that uh discarded crab uh, see the picture of discarded crab pot which has caught lot of crabs uh, and there are many such many such derelict pots and fishing gears lying around in the ocean and when we see uh, when, when we scale up the problem it means that loss of commercial uh, commercial fish available to fishermen also uh in the last picture you can see that nets can damage sensitive habitats like coral reefs uh which are breeding and feeding ground uh, feeding grounds of uh, many fish species so the impacts are threefold uh marine wildlife commercially important fish species and also marine habitat so because of these particular adverse impacts of uh, causing from fishing gear fishing gear related pollution is termed as one of the most threatening type of marine waste that you can find in the ocean surface i am not saying that plastic bottle lying on the ocean is not important uh, but the threatening potential wise fishing gear abandoned lost and discarded fishing gear is considered as one of the most threatening fraction of marine litter so continuing with the impacts on marine species uh, this this is a slide from usa uh, you can see there are thousands of dolphins sea turtles and whales they get entangled and uh, die due to uh, due to the entanglements and other ill impacts from the aldfgs also some of the valuable fish species as i mentioned earlier they get lost uh, because uh, lost and fishers fail to reach their quota uh, and this is clearly an economic impact of uh, aldfg there are several secondary impacts as well well fishing the fishing gears as it is made up of synthetic fibers such as polyethylene polypropylene nylon after a point of time they start degrading into microplastics also these microplastics and fishing gears they act as a carrier of persistent and bioaccumulative toxic substances which is also known as pbts they also help in transport uh, transportation of invasive species, invasive species. ingestion of marine organism uh, these particular plastic fishing gears can be ingested by marine organisms and which will eventually end up in our food chain and it also disturbs the near shore habitat well i would like to uh, grab your attention on this particular slide well this is a picture that we have taken couple of years ago uh, and this is from the runde bird sanctuary of norway runde bird sanctuary is Uh, provide safe haven to thousands of migratory bird species every year 
and if you see the birds actually come over here and they they create their own nests through naturally occurring fibers such as grass or something else but this in in this picture you can see uh, some of the nests have or most of the nests have uh, you can see the green and they are made up of green and orange fibers these fibers are nothing but uh, the outcomes of degraded ropes and fishing gears so this particular picture grabbed a lot of uh, media attention in norway because uh, people or scientists ornithologists con con concluded that the abundance of fishing gear related pollution in the ocean it's so much that birds are now starting to replace the natural grass fibers by uh, fishing gear related pollutants or so to say uh, ropes and threads from uh, that you find from the synthetic fishing gears so this brings to another dimension of the problems uh, occurring from aldfg it not only it impacts the ocean life it, it also in a way uh, have several terrestrial impacts such as seabirds are found to ingest and entangle uh, get entangled in the uh, in this particular aldfgs several research uh, articles show that seabirds as an indicators of distribution trends and population levels get affected by plastics especially from aldfg you can see there are several such pictures available on internet through various scientific reports and so on if i talk about the composition of marine waste uh, the paper from imr uh, marine institute uh, marine research institute of bergen in norway they showed that the norwegian seas such as barents and uh, norwegian sea shows most of the litter fractions or most of the items that you find in these particular ocean surfaces are coming from fishing gears so to summarize the environmental impact so far we know that uh, very few literature or very few studies are available to estimate the impacts or to to calculate the true cost of uh, environmental impact caused by ldfg although scientists have con uh, concluded that ldfg is one of the most threatening fractions in marine litter still we know very little uh, uh, still we have very little knowledge about the extent and the fate of uh, plastics from fishing gears we have seen some studies such as 30 33000 nets are estimated to be lost in uh, lost by european fisheries annually or approximately 640000 tons of fishing gears are lost globally each year and so on these particular estimates are from 2007 and 2009 and they are global estimates so we cannot really design local policies based on these particular estimates so more localized and more regional uh, data and information is needed in order to establish new policies and uh, effective management strategies to curb plastic pollution from fishing gears that brings me to the second part of my presentation we identified this problem that there was overall lack of information when it comes to plastics from fishing sector and that's where uh, my phd in in my phd we initiated a research on focusing on fishing gear resource management in norway well norway uh, is kind of uh, norway is characterized by almost 25000 km long coastline long and productive coastline and fishing is one of the primary industrial occupation that uh, norway has norway also is a leader when it comes to uh, capture fisheries in eu and eea and it ranks 7th in terms of global fish production so fishing is uh, practiced widely and it's one of the most commercial uh, commercially important activity in norway but again because of the lack of estimates and lack of information available we don't know much of how uh, we don't know how to manage waste from fishing sector in norway so that's how we initiated material flow we decided to do material flow analysis on fishing gears the objective of this study was to map the typical life cycle system of six fishing gears used in the commercial fishing fleet fleet in norway and then scientifically estimate average annual purchase repair and disposal patterns of these fishing gears to estimate the quantities of plastics entering in the ocean as aldfg and then uh, further to 
estimate annual quantities of plastic polymers collected after the end of life. So before, begin, before talking about the MFA study, I would like to define how the commercial fishing looks, uh, looks like in Norway. The structure of commercial fishing fleet in Norway, uh, Norwegian fishing fleet is consisting of around 5,500 fishing vessels. That includes both deep water as well as coastal vessels. And typical fishing gears used in Norway are trawls, sign, Danish signs, long line, kill nets, and crab pots, for example. So the term plastic from now on includes polyethylene, polypropylene, and nylon, which are building blocks of any fishing gears that are manufactured within the region. So in order to manage or in order to assess the uh, impact from any product, we need to understand how that product, uh, the, the typical life cycle of uh, that particular product. So just like any other product, fishing gears are designed and produced, and then they are sold to fishers, which is the use phase. And in the post-use phase, they are fishers continuously try to repair and reuse the fishing gears. And then the end of life uh, phase is kind of interesting when it comes to fishing gears. The other products, they usually either uh, we recycle them, we incinerate them or landfill them. But in case of fishing gears, they are also uh, fishers abandoned, lost or discard them in the ocean. Or also sometimes fishing gears are abandoned or discarded on land. So the end of life uh, scenarios for fishing gears have five different types of uh, alternatives. So when we talk about getting information uh, on these particular fishing gear related problems, we need to identify who are the stakeholders involved in the systems. In this particular uh, case of fishing gear, uh, fishing gear in Norway, we have identified several stakeholders such as ports and harbors, fishers, uh, relevant NGOs and research, research agencies, such, uh, then fishing gear suppliers and manufacturers, waste management companies, recycling companies, and so on. If you look at this particular slide carefully, the fishers and fishers association have the ability to provide information on almost throughout the life cycle phases of fishing gears. So that's why they are considered as one of the most important stakeholders. The resource users itself are considered as one of the most important stakeholders to obtain information on various uh, aspects of fishing gears. So of course, the fishers have a lot of information on the operation use and post-use phases of fishing gears. But this information was not collected, not, so to say, compiled or uh, not scientifically presented anywhere. So we had to create a survey and this particular survey was conducted uh, among the Norwegian fishers. We covered almost 114 fishers from southern part of Norway to northern part of, uh, northernmost part where the fishing is practiced in Norway and learned the annual purchase patterns of new fishing gears, annual repair uh, and the frequency of repairs for the fishing gears, typical lifespan of various fishing gears, and then how often fishers lose fishing gears in the ocean, and then how often they discard a type of fishing gears. And then the information from fishers are, uh, is represented through various graphs and then we used this information to find out, for example, on the rightmost figure, the topmost figure, you can see the percentage repair and uh, part replaced. So you can see the trawls and purse signs. The bigger the fishing gears, the most expensive fishing gears are repaired more often, whereas uh, the cheap fishing gears or le less expensive fishing gears, such as gill nets, traps, fishers don't care much. Uh, or fishers do not take much effort to repair and replace parts for these particular fishing gears. Similarly, uh, the important parameter over here was to find out how often fishers lose which type of fishing gears. Not all the fishing gears are equally prone to get lost in the ocean. For example, if you look at purse sign, which is uh, which weigh around 35 to 40,000 kilos, and which is one of the most expensive fishing gears, 
fishers if they lose this particular type of fishing gear they will do many efforts to retrieve it back and it is also easy to retrieve uh, the fishing gear such as purse line but the other fishing gear such as traps or long lines or even gill nets they are more prone to get lost in the ocean than others there are also various actors acting to prevent and to manage plastic pollution in norway uh, some of the actors are for example whole norger and these are beach cleanup operators in norway what they do is they conduct voluntary beach cleanup operations all across norway and in for example in 2017 almost 50000 volunteer participated uh, to collect around 1300 tons of uh, marine waste from norwegian beaches then there are recyclers such as no fear and no prick uh, who collect waste plastic from fishing and aquaculture sector in 2017 more than 6000 tons of plastic material was recovered from aquaculture and fishing sector both aquaculture is also known as fish farming uh the fiscal directorate or the norwegian directorate of fisheries uh, conducts annual one month retrieval operation to collect abandoned lost and discarded fishing gears in norway and they recover annually 30 to 45 tons of ndfg from norwegian waters the norwegian fiscal directorate is conducting this operation since 1980s uh, which is one of the uh, and until date it is one of the only governmental attempt to get into the ocean in order to retrieve the lost fishing gears uh the fishing for litter is also sponsored program by environmental directorate of norway where they contract the local fishers to collect marine waste during fishing operation in 2017 almost 65 tons of marine waste was collected through this proto- th- through this particular program so we obtained all this particular information from fishers from all these uh, various actors from beach cleanup operations uh, fishing gear suppliers and manufacturers and use these particular numbers to see what happens in norway uh, in the commercial fishing practices of norway throughout one year so i'll try to spend some time on this slide uh, this slide shows the material flow analysis or the material flow analysis of plastics which is polyethylene polypropylene and nylon which is coming from commercial fishing gears deployed in norway 2016 2017 so this is what uh, what you are seeing is what happens in norway in one year uh, in the commercial fishing sector so if you see uh, on from the leftmost side around 2600 uh, tons of fishing gears are 2600 tons of plastic is entering in the system from purchased fishing gears and the repair and uh, recycle uh, repair and reuse pattern is very well established fishers maintain and repair their fishing gears quite often and sometimes during repair they have to take out the old part or rotten part of fishing gear and replace the replace it with new parts so the new parts uh, through that replacement operations around 1800 tons of plastic is entering in the system in the form of replaced parts of fishing gears around 400 tons of fishing gears are getting lost or discarded in the uh, in the ocean and through the beach cleanup operations or through the ocean cleanup operations only around 80 to 90 tons of fishing gears are retrieved every year that leaves around 300 tons of waste plastic or lost plastics in, uh, from the fishing sector in the ocean which which is which is accumulating in ocean every year from commercial fishing practices of norway all these particular collected waste from beaches from oceans from waste from repair facilities and also from uh, the, the disposed fishing gears by fishers they ultimately end up in the waste management facilities of norway and if you look at it carefully almost 50% of uh, waste plastic is segregated and sent abroad for recycling the recycling does not take place in norway or at least in 2016 2017 that that was the picture even today very little industrial uh, scale recycling happens in norway and almost 25% uh, waste fraction goes to landfill and the other remaining fraction goes on for incineration so now we learned that 
around 4000 to 4500 tons of waste plastic is getting collected in the waste management facilities of Norway from commercial fishing sector alone do we have good management strategies available what are the regulatory and industrial response responses towards this particular collected waste how and why there are no recycling facilities in Norway and can we use circular economy type of principles to close the loop of these plastics from fishing sector that is where we'll focus uh, on in the last part of this uh, presentation. Starting with the regulatory mechanisms, of course, there are several international and regional mechanisms available to control uh, or to manage this particular, uh, to regulate the fishing gear, fisheries sector. On international scale, we have Uniclaws, London Protocol, IMO's Port Reception Facility, uh, Honolulu Strategy, and UNEP guidelines for managing or handling ALDFG. On the regional level, we have European Union's Port Reception Facility Directive, uh, EU Marine Strategy Framework, OSPAR Guidelines, Helsinki Convention, and so on. If you look at these international and regional uh, regulatory mechanisms, they all contribute uh, to four types of uh, management measures. First is preventive, that is reducing uh, the source reduction trying to avoid fishing gear entering in the ocean as, uh, and causing ALDFG type of, uh, uh, or causing drillic fishing gear problem. The second one is mitigating. Uh, this, this can be done through setting up port reception facilities and dumping regulations and so on. Third one is removing. This, is, this can be done by beach cleanup operations or uh, closely monitoring the fishing gears and also retrieval of fishing gears from the ocean. Uh, such uh, like Fiscal Directorate or Norwegian Fishing Directorate does. And then some of the strategies are also, some of the measures are also pointed towards behavior changing. That, that can be done through awareness or programs to reduce LDFG extent. Also guiding fishers to establish better fishing practices to avoid uh, LDFG generation. Industrial mechanisms, there are several industries trying to work towards better management of fishing gears and try to solve this particular uh, ALDFG problem. Till 2000, 2010, fishers were not aware of uh, fishing, the problems from ALDFG or derelict fishing gears, but because ocean is considered as one of the biggest landfill out there. So you just throw everything over there and you cannot see it through your naked eyes. But as the, fishing practices are increasing as uh, the extent of pollution is increasing as this all the entire ocean ecosystem is collect, connected in the world so what the waste that is thrown in africa or india is you can find it in in the other parts of the world for example so because of that the problems from aldfg as uh, are becoming more and more apparent for, uh, to fishers and their involvement is becoming more and more active and then the industrial actors are also acting to reduce this particular ALDFG formation in the ocean. One of the attempt, one of such attempt is the flotation device for retrieving lost crab pots and traps. So if you see uh, crab pots has, a, has an opening traditionally, and this opening is now made up with the non-synthetic fiber, which will eventually uh, in 10 to 14 days, it will, it will be degraded if it is not retrieved from the ocean. And the, opening will then get separated from the uh, from the unit and then it will come up as a float where someone can spot where the crab pot is and for example uh, the the entangled marine organisms or crabs in the crab pot can leave uh, the crab pot so there won't be any damage uh, of loss of life of crabs due to lost fishing gears or lot uh, lost crab pots so that sort of uh, new design design improvements in uh, various fishing gears are happening parallelly. Many researchers and many industries are investigating into biodegradable fishing gears uh, and they are making good progress towards it so that once fishing gear get lost in the ocean, they cannot, uh, it won't stay there for long. Uh, it, will, it will be degraded sooner or later into the, uh, through biodegradable fishing nets. Another attempt is developing fishing gears with radio frequency identification, RFID, 
if you see the last figure the yellow uh, the yellow structure over there is nothing but an rfid the problem with this technology is this won't work well when uh, you do the deep water fishing because it is it becomes more and more difficult to get the signal back uh, in the deep from the deep waters so the more is more and more research is going on to improve this particular technology and improve the rfid so that lost fishing gears can be retrieved easily similarly uh, in norway mechanical recycling uh, of fishing gears is a reality not only in norway in many of the nordic regions or scandinavian region fishing gears can be mechanically recycled to produce for example hdp high density polyethylene and low density polyethylene type of polymers these pellets then can be used as a raw material for any injection molding produced plastic equipments for example chairs or in norway the industrial attempt is happening uh, industrial pilot plants are pilot testing is uh, happening parallelly where these hdp and ldp recycled from waste fishing gears can be used to produce walkways and uh, nets of aquaculture or fish farms for example and if this sort of uh, these sort of models can be looked up, looked upon as industrial symbiosis or eco industrial partnerships where waste from one sector can be used as raw material in another sector and this is also uh, so to say a definition of what circular economy is intending to uh, provide for the management of waste plastic well these sort of circular business models of course come with uh, it it has a lot of promise but there are several barriers in realizing the circular economy approaches in norway for example in our research we identified that what are the critical factors for developing a circular business model and what is the current status when it comes to realizing the circularity uh, in the system well from our research we showed that raw material is available in this case raw material is end of life plastics from fishing gears so we we have shown that almost 400 4500 tons of waste plastic is collected at the waste management facilities from fishing sector alone but the supply chain is lacking there are no actors who work on uh, so to say providing waste from fishing sector towards the recycling facilities for example so that sort of su supply chain is almost non existent in 2016 2017 recycling technology there are several actors industrial actors shown that mechanical recycling is possible of uh, aldfg although there are several uh, issues so ease of recycling is very low and this is due to fishing gears are often laden with biomass or sort of rotten biomass or fish oil so that they need proper segregation proper clean up before uh, they are supposed to uh, before you can actually recycle it also many fishing gears have complicated fishing uh, complicated designs they are made with metal wires and so to say various sorts of uh, lead and other type of uh, other type of material so in order to recycle them we need to segregate all these items and then only recycle plastic so that sort of segregation uh, makes ease of recycling very low when it comes to fishing gears also there are very little policy drivers available that that could force fishers or so to say waste managers to do uh, to motivate recycling is uh, over landfilling or incineration of fishing gears also the awareness was uh, very little when we interviewed the stakeholders in 2018 2019 nobody knew much about the circularity or the circular economic options that one can establish through these sorts of uh, recycling and reusing uh, reusing of polymers and of course market economy was almost non existent so even though you can create these pallets but there were so the recyclers may do the recycling and create these particular pallets but then there is no market value to it because there is there are no takers so establishing new recycling business was uh, counterproductive at this particular moment so how are we going ahead 
with this? How can we do or what are the upcoming trends when it comes to uh, management of fishing gears related waste? Well, first and foremost, we need to develop or we need to design fishing gears for recycling. Currently, as I mentioned earlier, fishing gears are made up of many polymers. It's a complex mix. And then along with metal components, it, it makes them challenging for recycling. So it, the research should, be, research should be focused or targeted so that uh, there are designed improve, design improvements and fishing gears can be designed through homogeneous materials so that recycling ease could be attained. Of course, there are several opportunities for industrial symbiosis. Uh, uh, recycled HDP and LDP from fishing gears can be, uh, we can replace them. We can replace the virgin polymers through recycled HDP and LDP from fishing sector to create business case of closed loop solutions, which I just showed in the earlier slide. Also, we need to improve the, we need to build the capacity to improve recycling. Waste management companies must be well informed and equipped to segregate and sort the fishing gears to improve percentage of recycling. As, as you can see from the MFA diagram, almost 50% of the fraction uh, is either sent to landfill or so to say incinerated. The incineration happens solely because fishing gears are consisting of rotten biomass and uh, fish oil. So the waste manager do not understand if, uh, if this sort of waste is actually recycled. Uh, or recyclable fraction, and they simply send them to, uh, they segregate them with, with respect to food waste type of uh, options, and then rather they actually burn it or incinerate it instead of recycling. Also, we need to improve or we need to investigate various tech pack schemes, uh, where, which is also part of experiment producer responsibility, where collection of products after their end of life uh, can be achieved. So the manufacturers should take the responsibility for taking back the sold fishing gears from fishers at the end of useful life, or may this can also be done by partially financing collection and recycling facilities within the region. Finally, uh, marine debris and ghost fishing is a transboundary problem, as I mentioned. All the ocean surfaces, uh, all the ocean uh, oceans in the world are connected. So what happens in Norway or what happens in India or South Africa is going to affect other parts of the world. LDFG starting to dominate the marine litter across European waters. Uh, and then, of course, there are several documented negative impacts on of LDFG on marine ecosystem. It is causing loss of feedstock and several other secondary socioeconomic impacts. And the threat of microplastic and disruption of food chain is still understudied. So we still don't know what is happening on that front. We, going ahead, we need more collaborative efforts with resource users to mitigate and minimize the problem. Uh, holistic understanding of fishing gear system life cycle is essential. More scientific inputs are needed to understand toxicity, fate, transport, mortality rates, and magnitude of ALDFG. And we need to create economic incentives for collection, recycle, the reuse of discarded fishing gears. And of course, prevention of ALDFG is far more important and effective than mitigation. Also, we need to do more research when it comes to advancement in gear design to minimize the bycatch and ghost fishing type of uh, impacts. I have summarized some of the suggested readings. So if you are interested in this particular topic, you must go through this particular literature so that uh, you, come in, comes in, you, you can come in terms with what is the latest knowledge on the ALDFG pollution. Thank you so much. Paratosh, um, that was that was great, really informative. Um, thank you so much. I see we do have a, a few questions here in the chat. Um, I see we are a teensy bit behind time, but I think we've got time for a few questions. Uh, so there's one that says, "Is there a reason why the fishing sector was not being considered?" I think that's in that, that was early on in the session. So perhaps in reference to one of your your early slides. Um, I think perhaps in terms of the. Um, when they were first sort of tracking uh, plastic pollution, plastic waste, is there a reason the fishing sector waste wasn't considered initially? 
Yes, uh, that's a good question. But uh, the answer is answer to that uh, question or my response is just because there was no information available. Uh, if you see, if you look at it, nobody actually, uh, you will find very few estimates on fishing gear related waste that is going around. So because of lack of information, or if you look at Jena Jembeck's paper in 2015, they said that because of lack of information on fishing sector across the globe, we have to neglect this particular fraction. Uh, so the reasons for neglection is not really explained over there, but lack of information or lack of data keeping is one of the major factor which is hindering the sustainable management of plastics or fishing gear resources in general. Today, now we are seeing a lot of problems due to LDFG and now scientists are added, have identified uh, LDFG as most threatening factions. So many people are investigating their impacts, they're uh, trying to create evidences on plastics from fishing sector. So I see in coming five years, lack of data wouldn't be a problem on fishing sector at least. Thank you, Paratosh. Uh, then I see there's another question here that says, do you think EU directives will contribute to a solution inclusive of EPR legislation? And national legislation is already proposed in Sweden based on EU regulations. Yes, I uh, definitely think EU has several, a lot of potential uh, in mitigating this particular Ill negative impacts on L of LDFG on, uh, on the marine ecosystem. There are several directives, not only extent producer responsibility, EU has also recently come up with new directive of port reception facilities. And when it comes to Norway, for example, we only have 30% of the ports that, are, uh, that have the port reception facility. For others to understand port reception facilities, nothing but a dustbin, for example, that everyone needs to have uh, on the port where fishers can or fishing vessels can dispose of their uh, waste fishing gears and also other little waste. So that improves the collection. In Norway, due to difficult geographic structure, we have thousands of ports and only 30% of uh, them have port reception facility. And the new mandate of EU port reception facility says that almost all the port, 100% of the ports should have this port reception facility. So without that, collecting waste fishing gear is becoming more and more problematic. Also inclusive APR uh, legislation. Uh, in Norway, there is white paper uh, on external producer responsibility and how it can be included uh, in, the, in, the, in the reality. Of course, there are many challenges in actually or practical implement, practically implementing that strategy in any country. But I think that is the future or immediate future uh, that could e quickly solve or significantly solve the problem of uh, mismanagement of ALDFG. Uh, thanks, Paratosh. Um, I actually just wanted to, to build on that question. Can you comment on the efficacy of the different regulatory, regulatory mechanisms that you mentioned? I know you spoke about a few international ones, the Honolulu um, one, UNEF, etc. Can you compare those perhaps to the regional ones? Are the regional ones more effective in terms of um, yeah, in, in terms of what is needed and, and assessing the current situation, as you mentioned, with the, um, the uh, having an appropriate facility dis to dispose of fishing gear at ports? Yeah, that's a good question uh, again. See, all these strategies, they mean well, but they are not coherent in some sense, uh, especially. When you look at it in a scientific perspective, why there is no information on fishing gears is that the another reason is the monitoring or data keeping is kind of uh, haphazard, if I, I would use that word. So for example, OSPAR or other guidelines, they mandate that whatever litter items that you find on the, uh, on the beaches, you must segregate them based on the fixed category, which is mentioned in OSPAR guidelines. So uh, when the volunteers collect these particular waste from beaches, they, some of them use OSPAR guidelines and they segregate the waste based on whether it is more than two meters or less than two meters in size. And then you cannot use that particular information to manage any, uh, to create any positive policy input, for example. So when I was doing my research, I had, I wanted all the data in terms of mass because I wanted to estimate how much waste plastic is created from uh, fishing sector. But then when I talked to uh, 
beach cleanup operation operators in in the region we got the information in terms of how how many atoms they collected in terms of the sizes not the mass uh, specific so it can mean up to 5 meters or it can also mean 50 meters or 500 meters for example so then you need to approximately estimate how much was the mass and whether that particular fishing gear uh, is it coming from fishing gear or not so if this particular uh, there are also lot of literature talking about the, and highlighting this problem that because of non coherence in the guidelines the data keeping is affected and without data or without having proper inputs from uh, the stakeholders we cannot design or we cannot monitor uh, the policies on waste management that is what is hindering the overall management of the sector i think so one thing if i would want to change in re regional or international policies is they need to sit down together and create a coherent strategy for data keeping so that monitoring and management strategies could be much more effective in the future um do you know if any standardized methodologies ha have been assessed thus far or is it a case of there wasn't adequate stakeholder engagement to to contribute to those standardized methods uh the attempts i know i'm aware that the attempts are happening on making coherent strategies to monitor uh, any sorts of litter not only fishing related mm -hmm. but i am not sure if uh, they have reached on some sort of uh, agreement and how to do that for example so not that i have uh, i haven't read about it at least okay okay from my side okay thanks thanks paratosh um i i know um uh, some of our researchers have sort of put together a manual on um on litter monitoring Um, and things like that, but uh, I don't. I don't believe that there's a section on fishing gear, so I was just curious if there, if there were standardized practices. Um, no, not to my knowledge either. Okay, um, thank you so much. I, I see we we have gone slightly over time, but um, it was really really interesting hearing what you had to say. I mean, the fact that uh, the definition of ghost gear goes back to the 70s was yeah, just kind of brings home how long the the issue has has been around. So it's it's great to hear about the the potential solutions that are coming through there. Um, if anyone does, I don't see any other questions in the chat or the Q and A. But if anyone does have any, you're welcome to to email us, and we can pass those along to to Paratosh. Um, the recording will also be available on YouTube, um, so you can also go back and and pause for the reading list <laughs> that that Paratosh supplied there. Um, and then otherwise, we will hopefully see you all next week um, at our our next session. Um, it'll be the same time, and the um, The link will be the link is available on our events page on the SST website, and we will send through an email with the with the information for next week's session. Um, thank you so and, much all for attending this session, and thanks for the interesting questions. Thanks, Paratosh. I see there's a comment here that says a very good presentation brings us forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next week. Bye bye.